begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen O Mary conceived without sin pray for us who have recourse to thee all you holy angels and saints pray for us may the divine assistance be always with us may the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace Amen in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen Last night, we saw that St. Peter gave one of the most remarkable prophecies in the entire Bible in his second epistle, chapter 3, to actually warn us against evolution-based modern thousand years ahead of time, because our Lord showed him that this deception was going to be so destructive that he wanted apparently to give us a warning in the Holy Scriptures. And we saw that in this remarkable prophecy, St. Peter says that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the Word of God in Genesis and saying that things have always been the same from the beginning of creation and we saw that this is actually a lie from the pit of hell even though it sounds because we've all grown up believing that things have been more or less the same from the beginning and that it's perfectly legitimate for natural scientists to study the universe as it is today and extrapolate from that all the way back to the very beginning of the universe in reality, we saw last night that every apostle, father, doctor, pope, and council father in their authoritative teaching taught that things have not always been the same from the beginning of creation. That the entire work of creation in the beginning was supernatural and that when God finished creating Adam, body and soul and Eve from Adam's side, he stopped creating new kinds of creatures. The work of creation was finished and only then did the natural order that we're living in, what many doctors call the order of providence, only then did the natural order begin. And then of course when the original sin took place, the whole universe was changed and made subject to a bondage to decay. So according to the whole tradition of the church, there is absolutely no way that things have always been the same from the beginning. And it's impossible to study the universe as it is today and extrapolate from that all the way back to the beginning to figure out how everything came to be. It would be like a very intelligent person who's never seen a computer before and he stumbles upon a functioning computer with a working operating system and because he's very smart and very curious he eventually begins to figure out how this operating system works but then he tries to explain into existence by studying the operating system it doesn't matter how smart he is, he will never figure it out because the process by which the computer was manufactured is a different process from the one by which it operates. And what modern science has been trying to do for the last 100 years is to explain the origins of the computer in terms of the working of the operating system. And it doesn't matter how brilliant the scientists are, how much technology they have, how much money they have, they can't get it right. But St. Peter says these scoffers will have to ignore two facts, not just one. The first fact that they have to ignore is that God spoke everything into existence in the beginning. He says they'll have to ignore the fact that it was the Word of God that created the heavens and the earth and all they contain. Not a natural process like a supernova explosion. But secondly, he says, they will have to ignore the fact that there was a divine judgment upon the world at the time of Noah 
that totally destroyed the face of the earth. So that he actually says here, the world that then was perished in the flood. So we can't even look at the earth as it is today and understand what it looked like before the flood because it was truly a kind of new creation through the catastrophe of Noah's flood. So when we want to understand the true history of mankind and of the world, there are two things that we have to resurrect. One is the true doctrine of creation, but the other one is the historical reality of the global flood in the time of Noah. And so that's what I'm going to focus on today. The evidence for it and why it is so important for our times to understand that there really was a global flood in the time of Noah. Now, it might interest you to know that skepticism about the Noah's flood is not new. St. James of Nisibis is one of the great saints of Ar the Armenian Church, which was possibly the first Christian kingdom in the world where the king accepted Christianity and the whole kingdom be became Christian. But St. James of Nisibis, who attended the First Council of Nicaea, was very upset in the fourth century because some people in his flock had doubts about Noah's flood and the ark. Can you imagine? And he was so upset about this that the tradition in the Armenian church records that he set out to find that ark because they knew that it had come to rest in the mountains of Ararat, which are visible from the mother church, the mother cathedral of the Armenian church, because he was determined to show everybody that the ark was real and that its remains could be found in the mountains of Ararat. But God apparently did not want the ark to be found at that time. There's a time for everything in God's providence. And apparently it wasn't time because an angel stopped St. James and, in, and said or gave him a piece of the ark. And to this day, that piece of the ark that was given by the angel to St. James of Nisibis is in a museum to the mother church of the Armenians. And that's just a, uh, an indication that skepticism about Noah's flood and the ark is not anything new, but that the attitude of the saints has always been that this skepticism is a sign of very weak faith and should not be given into. And this is a picture of the, um, the cathedral, which is the mother church of the Armenians. And in the background, you can see Ararat, where the ark came to rest. And there's a beautiful tradition in the Armenian church that where the church was built is where Noah offered sacrifice when he came down from Ararat. So, why did the intellectual elite of the Christian world slowly but surely go over to the idea that Noah's flood was not a global flood, it was just a local flood? Well, again, it goes back to the so-called Enlightenment thinkers like Rene Descartes who believed that everything should be subject to rational investigation and evaluation in terms of our experience of this natural order of things. So for these people, if something doesn't have a natural explanation, there's no explanation. And unfortunately, we know very well that modern science has been dominated by this rationalistic attitude, even though it's actually completely unreasonable. Because reason alone can tell us, as St. Thomas 
and many of the fathers and doctors have done, that nature cannot explain itself. It's completely unreasonable to hold that something that's finite and contingent can explain its own existence. So a reasonable person actually has to conclude that there's a supernatural explanation for the natural universe. And yet, we're considered to be unreasonable if we don't agree with them that there's a naturalistic explanation for everything. It, it would be funny if millions of souls weren't at stake in this disagreement. And Blaise Pascal, who was a contemporary of Descartes and every bit as great a genius, showed remarkable foresight when in his masterpiece, Pensée, he wrote these words. He said, I cannot forgive Descartes. In all his philosophy, he did his best to dispense with God. Oh, he could not avoid having him start the world in motion with a flip of his thumb. But after that, he had no more use for God. Isn't that amazing? Way back in the 17th century, Blaise Pascal saw that if you accept this lie from the pit of hell, that things have always been the same from the beginning of creation, what do you need God for? All you need God for is to make that alleged Big Bang happen, or whatever you want to call that first moment of the universe, and then you can forget about him. Because if things have always been the same from the beginning, then all you have to do is study the natural order now and extrapolate from that all the way back into the past and explain how everything came to be. And we saw last night that the second wave of the evolution revolution was the geological revolution where Charles Lyell and James Hutton principally in the late 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century embraced this false enlightenment philosophy and made their guiding principle the present is the key to the past. And according to this principle, the whole idea that there could have been a global flood was ruled out. Because if the presence, the key to the see are localized processes going on, then obviously the idea that there was a global cataclysm has to be relegated to the category of some kind of myth or fairy tale. And so we saw that Lyle and Hutton and their disciples imagined that sedimentary rocks formed when great bodies of water came over the land, sediments settled out, the water hardened into rock, the waters withdrew, and then this was repeated over and over again over eons of time. And we saw that if this were true, and it isn't, because as we'll see in a few minutes, empirical science has created facilities where natural scientists can actually study how sediments are laid down by moving currents of water in the real world, and they don't support Lyle and Hutton's idea about how sedimentary rocks were formed at all. But if Lyle and Hutton were correct, then of course when we looked at the big sedimentary rock formations all over the earth, like the Grand Canyon shown here, then we would see, we would know that the layer at the top was formed very recently to the ones at the bottom which must have formed eons and eons ago and if that were true and of course it isn't then the fossils and the rocks would seem to tell the story of life developing from the simpler to the more complex from the fish to the amphibian to the reptile to the bird to the mammal and finally to man and that's how we get Darwin because Darwin takes Lyell and Hutton's wild speculations in geology, which are totally based on Descartes' wild speculations in philosophy that he got from the spirit of truth, alias Lucifer, as we saw last night, and Darwin builds on these terrible foundations to give us the tree of death. The idea that it's through hundreds of millions of years in the current iteration of Darwin's original hypothesis that 
human beings came into existence through a process of death, destruction, and struggle for existence over hundreds of millions of years. And that's, of course, how we get human evolution. Now, what I want to do now is to focus on, first, very briefly, the theological arguments for the global flood, for the literal historical truth of the Mosaic account of the flood in Genesis. And then I want to look at some of the scientific evidence for the global flood. And then finally talk about why it is so important, especially for our young people, to understand that there really was a global flood in the time of Noah. Now, there are five principal arguments that we can make from the theological side why there was a global flood in the time of Noah. The first one is that our Lord Jesus Christ himself testified to the global nature of the flood. Our Lord talks about his second coming as an event that is going to affect every creature on earth when it occurs. And the only event in all of history that he can compare it to is Noah's flood. Because Noah's flood is the one event in history prior to his second coming that affected every single creature on earth when it occurred. Now, two ecumenical councils, the Council of Trent and Vatican I, defined that when all the fathers of the church agree on any interpretation of scripture that pertains to a doctrine of faith or morals, that is the truth and we have to believe it. And all the church fathers, without exception, including St. Augustine, taught that Noah's flood was a global flood and that Moses gave us a perfectly accurate historical account of that unique event. This is reflected in the fact that both in the Hebrew of the Old Testament and in the Greek of the New Testament, a specific word is used for Noah's flood that is never used for an ordinary flood. In the Greek New Testament, the word is cataclysmos, which is where we get our word in English, cataclysm. So if Noah's flood was a big local flood, as unfortunately most Catholic intellectuals in the Western world teach young people today, then there is absolutely no reason why this word is only used to refer to Noah's flood. For example, when our Lord tells the parable about the man who builds his house on sand and the flood comes and washes everything away, he doesn't use cataclysmos. He uses another Greek word for a flood, a big flood that washes this man's whole structure away. The only reason why this word, both in the Hebrew Scriptures and in the Greek New Testament and in the Septuagint is used is because Noah's flood is totally in a class by itself. Now another reason why we can be certain without even looking at the scientific evidence that Noah's flood was a real historical event is because it's ludicrous to think that God would tell Noah to spend many decades constructing an ark for all different kinds of animals when he could have just told him to move a few valleys over, as he told Abraham, for example, to leave where he was and go to another place. If it was a local flood, God would never have told Noah to devote all of this time and energy to building an ark. It's absurd. And why would God then have miraculously directed representatives of each kind of animal to go to the ark and get on board when he could have just had them move away? This is what animals do in nature, and they often have a kind of an instinct 
that a tsunami is coming and they move. <laughs> so when we tell our children Noah's flood was just a local flood, we destroy their faith because young people are not stupid. And when we tell them ridiculous things like this in our attempt to be up to date and in good standing with the world and the scientific thinking of the world, we destroy all of their respect for the Word of God and for the tradition of the church because they're not stupid. They know it is completely absurd to think that God would tell Noah to devote the better part of a hundred years to when he could have just been told to move a few valleys over. And finally, and most importantly, if Noah's flood was a local flood, then God is a liar. Now God is almighty. He can do anything, but they, he, there's one thing that God cannot do, and it's not because he's not omnipotent. He can't act against his nature. God cannot lie. Could I ask you to hold, hold it until the Q&A? Because immediately following this presentation, we are going to have a question and answer session. Um, but God cannot lie. And yet, after the floodwaters receded, God made a promise to Noah that he would never again bring a judgment upon the earth with water as he had done in the flood. Now if Noah's flood was a local flood, then God lied. Because we have had innumerable disastrous floods which have taken the lives of hundreds of thousands of people down through the centuries. And if Noah's flood was a local flood, then these floods make God a liar. The only way that God's promise could be true is if Noah's flood was a global flood in a category of its own. So much for the theological arguments. Now we want to look at some of the physical evidence. And so we're going to look at six bodies of evidence very quickly. The first one is we have eyewitness testimony handed down within virtually every people group on the face of the earth that there was a global flood. Second, we find marine fossils, fossils of creatures that lived in the sea on top of the world's highest mountains all over the earth. Number three, the mere fact that we have billions of well-preserved remains of all different kinds of plants and animals all over the earth is in and of itself a testimony to the global flood. Number four, we find sediment layers that cover vast areas, even entire continents, even extending from one continent to another, things that have absolutely no precedent in our experience of the natural course of events with localized floods. Number five, when we look at the way sedimentary layers have been deposited, we don't find any evidence of slow and gradual deposition or erosion. We see only evidence of very rapid deposition of these layers one on top of the other. And finally, for today, all over the earth, interesting phenomena of oversized valleys, great big valleys with itty bitty rivers running through them. And we see what are called water gaps, which are very, very difficult to explain without the global flood. And to that, I could just add one other thing that we'll mention very briefly, and that is that a huge amount of the Earth's surface on the continents consists of what geologists call planation surfaces. And these are not like diluvial plains where water erodes around a, a river. These are places where all different kinds of material was hardened or laid down 
some hard, some softer, and water came and sheared it <laughs> so it's completely flat. We've been spending a lot of time in Africa and 60% of the entire African continent is a planation surface. So um, you, ha you have to be talking about something very remarkable to, I guess the devil really didn't like that last part or something, because <laughs> I don't know if um, there's anything we could do to restore the sound, I'll just do my best to communicate the old-fashioned way for the time being and hope that you will be able to hear me. Um, but the point is, <laughs> it was no localized flood that turned 60% of the entire African continent into a planation surface. So let's go through this very quickly. Here you have a map that shows some of the places on Earth where the indigenous people have a account of a global flood that was handed down to them from their ancestors. And over here, we have a chart which documents the similarities between these different accounts and the biblical account. And what's remarkable is, not only do these accounts that we find among African people or Australian Aborigines or others all over the world, not only do they agree that there was a global flood and that the only people who survived were on a boat, they even include details like releasing a bird towards the end to find out when the waters recede. Things that are remarkably specific if these people weren't remembering the same event that Moses records in the sacred history of Genesis. So, when we find groups of people all over the entire earth who have a memory of the same event, the most logical explanation is that that event actually occurred. Otherwise, you have to take desperate measures and say that Carl Jung was right and they just had some kind of collective unconscious and the flood represents something psychological. But I prefer the more common sense explanation that when different groups of people all over the earth remember an historical event, that that historical event actually happened. That seems a lot more reasonable to me than Carl Jung's explanation. Now, the other thing I mentioned, the second point, was that we find fossils of marine creatures on top of the world's highest mountains all over the earth. Here you have fossil ammonites now, this is very remarkable, but within the context of a global flood, it makes perfect sense because, as we'll see a little bit farther on in the presentation, one of the things that happened during and probably towards the end of the global cataclysm is that the sediments which had been laid down all over the earth were very rapidly uplifted which is why the marine creatures that had been buried in the sediments suddenly found themselves 20,000 or more feet above sea level. It fits in perfectly with the global flood framework. In the Grand Canyon, we find something that is similar to other features of the same kind that we find all over the earth, and that is we find billions of straight-shelled sh straight chambered nautiloids which are found fossilized with other marine creatures in a seven-foot thick layer within the red wall limestone of Grand Canyon. And this fossil graveyard of all these marine creatures buried together stretches for 180 miles across northern Arizona into southern Nevada, covering an area of at least 10,500 square miles. What kind of local flood could possibly explain deposition of marine creatures in this way? Now the other thing about the fossils is they show evidence of having been formed very rapidly. 
For example, this is an ichthyosaur mom giving birth and was buried in the very act of giving birth to her baby. This is a reminder to us that fossilization actually requires very extraordinary conditions. Here in this part of North Carolina, creatures are dying all the time. You have raccoons and squirrels and all kinds of things dying in your woods. How many of them are being fossilized? Zero. <laughs> creatures are dying right now all around us and not a single one of them is going to become a fossil. The mere fact that we have billions and billions of well-preserved fossilized remains of every kind of plant and animal all over the entire face of the earth is proof that something totally unique happened in the past to produce fossilization on this scale. Now, Ms. Acker mentioned about dinosaurs and one of the things that I want to just underscore is that most of the dinosaur graveyards are places where we find dinosaur remains mixed together with remains of marine creatures even when the dinosaurs were land-dwelling dinosaurs. How do we explain that in terms of any kind of localized flooding? Localized floods are not going to bring whales out of the ocean and dump them together with land-dwelling dinosaurs. But that's exactly the kind of thing that we find in the dinosaur graveyards. The next point was the extent of the sedimentary layers that cover entire continents and then continue onto other continents. And there are what geologists call these mega sequences, about a half a dozen of them, which extend over multiple continents. Here's an example of one that covers most of what is now the continental United States. And um, here you can see what's called the Salk mega sequence, which is the attributed by geologists who accept the creation flood framework as the first significant deposit of the advancing flood waters. And piled on top of this then were a whole series of other mega sequences that cover multiple continents, six of them all together. Now to give you an idea of what we're talking about, these are the famous white cliffs of Dover in England. But these chalk beds extend from southern England all the way, all the way across Europe to the Middle East. Now what kind of localized deposition could deposit the same kinds of sediments over an area this vast? There's just nothing in our experience of localized deposition that can explain it. Similarly, I'm sure you've all had the experience of driving around our beautiful country and seeing in the road cuts these beautiful sedimentary layers and finding coal seams in the side of the road as you drive along. But how often do we reflect on the fact that the same coal beds that we have in, in the Midwestern United States extend, are picked up again in Europe and extend all the way to the Caspian Sea? These are the same coal beds, the same and compressed and turned into coal actually very rapidly, not over millions of years, extending over these enormous areas. What kind of local deposition could possibly have produced this type of phenomenon? And this leads to the other thing that we all have observed when we drive across our country that where we have these road cuts and we see these layers upon layers of different kinds of sedimentary rock, we see these very fine boundaries between the different layers. We don't see any evidence whatsoever of any kind of erosion taking place between these different deposits. 
And this is remarkable if these various uh, sedimentary deposits were laid down over millions and millions of years, then there would have been all kinds of opportunities for erosion and different kinds of, of creatures to change the surface of the deposit. We don't see any of that. We just see these very fine straight edges separating one layer from another from another. Ms. Acker mentioned the polystrate fossils, and these again are very difficult to explain within the evolutionary framework, but they make perfect sense within the flood framework. And when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, God actually gave us a living or real-time example of how polystrate fossils were formed because when Mount St. Helens exploded, mud flows stripped the sides of mountains of their trees, literally ripping them out, breaking them off at the base, carried them down into what's known as Spirit Lake and deposited them there and these trees floated for the most part upright, although sometimes at different angles, and then sediment kept coming in and filling in around these tree stumps. And these polystrate fossils generally have the same characteristics as the trees that were stripped off the sides of the mountains by Mount St. Helens eruption because they don't have root systems. They were clearly ripped out of the ground by some very powerful force and then deposited in sediments, which is why we find them preserved, because they were deposited very quickly and then buried in sediment that preserved them from the various uh, kinds of bacteria and other things that would normally tend to break down a tree trunk in a very short period of time so that it would be completely disintegrated in a few years. Now the other thing that very much helps to explain what we see in is the research that's been done in the field of sedimentology in the last 50 or 60 years. Because last night we mentioned that Charles Lyell and Charles uh, and James Hutton did not have any facilities for doing real empirical research in the field of sedimentology, where scientists study how sediments are laid down in the real world, which then turn into different kinds of sedimentary rock. And what this empirical research has proven is that Lyell and Hutton left out of account the most important factor in sedimentary deposition, which is moving currents of water. So the scientists who study these things today have enormous laboratories bigger than this hall where they have flumes in which they can control the type of sediment, the flow of the water, and all the different variables, and study how moving currents of water lay down sediments in the real world. And what they found is that in the real world, sediments are normally laid down by moving currents of water. They don't just settle out of still water as uh, Charles Lyell imagined that they usually did. And as you can see from this slide, what the empirical research shows is you could have a flood and the sediment that's being laid down at the bottom over here is being laid down exactly at the same time as the sediment at the top of the formation on the other side of the slide. But when Charles Lyell takes a walk in the country a few hundred years later and he looks at this formation after it's hardened, he's going to imagine that this particle down here was laid down perhaps hundreds or thousands of years before the particle over at the other end of the slide, when in fact they were literally deposited at exactly the same time. Now it used to be believed that this was true for all kinds of sedimentary rock, but not for mudstone, which makes up a lot of the sedimentary rock all over the earth. But interestingly enough, a scientist at Indiana State University named Jurgen Schieber has proven 
in the laboratory that even mudstone can form very, very rapidly if you have the right conditions. So basically, there's nothing in the sedimentary rocks all over the earth that hasn't been empirically proven to be able to be formed very rapidly by moving currents of water, depositing different kinds of sediment that get sorted, not by time, but according to their physical characteristics. As an example of how this revolutionizes our understanding of the past, here we see a section of the Grand Canyon called the Tonto Group. And according to the conventional thinking that assumes evolution to be true, it took millions and millions of years for that section of the Grand Canyon to be deposited. But in a peer-reviewed journal article that was published by the French, uh, the main geological journal uh, in France, Guy Berto and um, Steve Austin showed that in light of cutting edge empirical research in sedimentology, if you analyze the sediments that make up the Tonto group, they're consistent with the entire formation being laid down very rapidly by an enormous body of water that moved across what is now the southwestern United States. And it did not require more than perhaps a few days or a few weeks to deposit the whole thing. I mentioned that 60% of the African continent is a planation surface, and that's what it looks like. But you don't only find these in Africa, you find these all over the earth in various places. And this is where water sheared different kinds of sediments that had been deposited, some very hard, some soft, and indiscriminately leveled them over enormous areas. And this is very consistent with what would have happened in the recessive stage of the flood when the waters that had covered the earth now ran back into the ocean basins because that water had incredible force and it was literally capable of shearing anything, whether it was hard or soft material, and it leveled the whole surface of enormous areas of the continents, made them completely flat. Now another thing that happened in the recessive stage of the flood has left its relics all around us. And one of the wonderful things about regaining our belief in the sacred history of Genesis is it makes sense of the world around us. Evolution does not make sense of the world around us at all. And we've all noticed in our travels, even if we haven't traveled outside of the United States, that everywhere we go, we see enormous rivers, I'm sorry, enormous valleys with tiny little rivers running through them. Did you? Well, it really doesn't make all that much sense in an evolutionary framework, but it makes perfect sense within a flood framework because in the recessive stage of the flood, you would have had enormous amounts of water carving out enormous valleys as it found its way down to the oceans. But once the waters had receded from the continental surfaces, what you would be left with was, comparatively speaking, a very, very small amount of water, which is why you find these little rivers running through these enormous valleys. That's certainly the case in the Shenandoah Valley where I live. You have this tiny little Shenandoah River and you have the big valleys on, around both forks of the Shenandoah. Well, that makes perfect sense in light of the flood framework. But the other things that, that you've probably noticed is as you drive through these valleys, you'll find on the sides of the valleys these notches. Now some of them are places where water can still be seen coming through. But there are many places where you see these notches and there's no water there. Why is it that in valleys all over the world you have these notches which are often called wind gaps in the sides of valleys. How did they get there? 
it wasn't just normal wind erosion or rain because that would have more uniformly eroded the whole surface of the valley the, the, at the height of the valley. Something must have carved these water gaps or wind gaps in the sides of these valleys. And yet whatever that was isn't there. It's vanished without leaving any trace. Well, think about the recessional stage of the flood and all of a sudden it starts to make a lot of sense because as the waters were draining off the continents they would try to find the quickest way to get to the ocean basin and just like when we were children and we played at the seashore with water you know that the water will go through different channels but then the biggest amount of water will eventually find a big opening and all the water is going to start to go through that big opening leaving smaller eroded surfaces behind without any water in them anymore well that's exactly what must have happened in the recessive stage of the flood you had water trying to find the quickest way to get to the ocean and some of that water carved some notches in the sides of what are now our valleys but eventually the water got channeled into a few main channels to get to the ocean and left some of these notches behind without any water flowing through them it makes perfect sense in light of the flood framework but it's really very difficult to explain in terms of some kind of slow and gradual processes now the other thing that I'm sure that you've noticed is if you have ever been to the big mountains like the Rocky Mountains here in the US or the Alps or the Himalayas you'll find places in the Rocky Mountains where you have uplifts and layer upon layer of sedimentary rock folded at very tight angles with absolutely no evidence of any fracturing or shattering or deformation of any of the layers. Now, if these sediments were laid down over hundreds of millions of years, as the evolutionists say, they would have hardened and when that uplift occurred, there would have been shattering, there would have been deformation. Why is it that we don't see that? We see these uplifted mountains with layer upon layer upon layer and absolutely no fracturing, no deformation whatsoever. It's only possible because all those sediments were still moist and malleable when that uplift occurred and that's why they were all be able to be uplifted at these very sharp angles without any kind of fracturing or deformation. It makes perfect sense within the framework of the global flood. So these I think are some very powerful evidences from the physical world and from the testimony of mankind that Noah's flood was a real historical event. We have eyewitness testimony from people groups all over the world. We have marine fossils on top of the Earth's high mountains. Um, we have billions of well-preserved fossils all over the Earth of all different kinds of plants and animals. And I didn't mention a very important point that 95% of all of these fossils are of marine creatures. So all over the world you have marine creatures buried together with land plants and animals and that also is a very powerful testimony to the global flood. We have sediment layers that cover vast areas, even entire continents, even extending from one continent to another. We have no evidence of or little of slow and gradual erosion between the layers and we have oversized valleys, water gaps, and planation surfaces all over the earth. Now in the little bit of time that I have left, I want to speak very briefly about the flood mechanism and then I want to end by talking about why it is so important for us not to forget the historical reality of Noah's flood in these times. Now, Moses gives us certain information in the sacred history of Genesis and the church has always required us to believe that every single piece of information that he gives us is 100% correct. But Moses doesn't tell us everything about the mechanism that 
produced the, the flood. In fact, he doesn't give us that much information about it. So this is an area where it's perfectly legitimate for different scientists to have different hypotheses. And the two main hypotheses that are out there are what's called catastrophic plate tectonics, which I'll explain in a moment. And then there's another one called the hydroplate theory by Dr. Walt Brown, who had a PhD in mechanical, mechanical engineering from MIT and taught at the Air Force Academy. Um, the main thing that both of these hypotheses have in common, and I encourage you to go online and look them up and evaluate for yourselves which of the two you think is better, but they both agree that the original configuration of the land surfaces of the earth was one where they were, there was one Pangaea, one big continent, and that as a result of Noah's flood, this one Pangaea was broken up into the continents as we see them today. Now in mainstream geology, there's general agreement that the continents were originally joined together, but that they separated slowly and gradually over millions and millions of years. And there's some evidence that the plates on which the continents rest are actually moving very slowly apart from each other, and that in the mind of the mainstream geologist confirms that the separation of the continents occurred at the same rate over hundreds of millions of years. But that is an assumption because nobody's been able to go back and observe the continents moving apart for millions of years. It, nobody's been able to actually measure it for more than perhaps a few decades. So it's a huge assumption that everything has always operated in the past at the same rate that it's operating today. And there is a geophysicist, Los Alamos, maybe he still does, but he's generally considered, even by secular scientists, to be the world's greatest expert in computer modeling of geophysics. His name is Dr. John Baumgartner, and you can look him up on the internet, and you can see his YouTube videos where he explains how, in his expert opinion, what we actually see is consistent with catastrophic plate tectonics that at one point in the past the continents actually moved apart very rapidly and then they collided with either standing water or perhaps with each other and that's what produced the uplift of the mountains with the marine creatures then being raised up to in some cases 20,000 or more feet above sea level. I'm not really going to get into the mechanisms because what I've concluded after studying these things for the last 30 years is that the global flood was a divine judgment upon mankind. And St. Peter clearly puts it in a similar category to the work of creation, which was totally supernatural. So my considered judgment is that we're never going to come up with a purely naturalistic explanation of the flood <laughs> any more than we're going to come up with a naturalistic explanation of creation. Yes, the flood produced all kinds of physical effects, and as we've seen in the last few minutes, many of those can still be observed today. But that's not the same thing as being able to come up with a complete physical explanation or natural explanation for the global flood. And I think if you look at Dr. Walt Brown's hydroplate theory or Dr. Baumgartner's catastrophic plate tectonics theory, you're gonna find that there's something in both of them that doesn't really explain everything. And that doesn't bother me at all because God was clearly involved and there were miraculous things that we know took place because all those different kinds of animals showing up at one particular location, that didn't happen through any And perhaps to kind of reinforce this for us, Moses adds the detail that God shut the door on the ark. Noah didn't close it, 
the wind didn't blow, God himself shut the door, showing this was his divine judgment. He was 100% in control of everything that happened. And yes, that divine judgment left physical effects which can be observed all over the earth today, but they don't necessarily allow us to give a physical explanation. One thing I want to mention very quickly before I conclude, though, is that in these days when so many of our world leaders seem to have become obsessed with climate change and wanting to make that the main focus of every government in the entire world, the reality is that the most significant event in terms of climate change in the history of the earth was Noah's flood. And in fact, there is no way to explain the ice age without Noah's flood. The reality is any time any group of scientists tries to model an ice age looking at the experience that we've had of the earth over the last several hundred years, it fails. And for a very simple reason, the colder air gets, the less moisture it can hold. And yet, in order to produce an ice age, you've got to find a way to get so much moisture into the atmosphere that when you have a drastic drop of temperature, you're going to get enormous amounts of snow and ice pack that could produce something like the ice age that occurred. And you'll notice I say the ice age because the considered judgment of the natural scientists who accept the Word of God as it was understood in the church from the beginning is that there was only one ice age which lasted perhaps as much as 500 or 700 years. Not these multiple ice ages that we all learned about in school. The variations that we see could easily be some seasonal variations, but the consensus view among the natural scientists who take the Word of God and the tradition of the church seriously is that there was only one ice age and it was only possible because of Noah's flood because when Noah's flood occurred um, Moses tells us all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and when this occurred there was volcanic activity which we can see the remains of in the ring of fire that you can still find going around the earth through the oceans and when all this volcanic activity occurred there were unimaginable amounts of debris that were propelled up into the atmosphere and what did that do that blocked out uh, the light of the sun to a great extent but it also meant that water was being propelled up out of enormous reservoirs of water inside of the earth so you had at the same time a drop in temperature while the, the atmosphere was being saturated with water that was being shot up out of these enormous reservoirs inside the earth what is that a recipe for it's a recipe for an ice age because you have this perfect combination of plummeting temperatures while you have maximum humidity, maximum moisture in the atmosphere. And that's what could produce the enormous amounts of snowfall and ice pack that over a relatively short period of time could produce an ice age. You can't get that through slow and gradual changes such as we observe in normal conditions and have observed in history. Now the other thing that unfortunately our children is to, are, are often told is that this whole thing about Noah's Ark, it's, it's, it's something of a, uh, of a myth or a fairy tale of sorts and we shouldn't really take seriously all the details that Moses tells us about the Ark. In reality, the information that Noah gives us about the flood is to be taken very seriously and there was actually a team of engineers, experts in naval architecture in South Korea where using the information and the dimensions of the ark given by Moses they determined that the ark was perfectly designed for what it was meant to do, which was not to get from one place to another, it was to ride out the worst storm there ever was. They calculated, as experts in their field, that Noah's Ark, 
was able to withstand waves as high as 100 feet tall. That's how incredibly well designed it was to ride out the storm. And there have been other scientists who have looked at how many different kinds of creatures would have needed to be kept on the ark and have calculated that the ark, given the size that Moses describes in Genesis, could have held the equivalent of over 500 railroad cars in terms of space to hold animals and food and water, and that that's way more than enough room to hold representatives of every kind of creature. Because remember, every kind does not mean every breed of dog. All the dogs in the world could have been represented <laughs> just by a couple of representatives of their kind. And once you understand that, it's very easy to see how the ark, with the dimensions that it had, could have held every kind of creature that's described in the sacred history of Genesis. Another interesting thing is, um, we, we always have these people like Bill Nye telling us that people who believe in creation and in Genesis are science stoppers and that evolution is, is conducive to good scientific research. But again and again we find that it's, it's the other way around. And this is just one example I give and then I know I'm over my time. I've really got to wrap things up. But the, if you start with a typical evolutionary scenario, they're going to say that the original population of humans was perhaps uh, a few humans a hundred thousand years ago and today we've ended up with the, the population of over seven billion or whatever it is that we have on earth today. But in reality we have historical records that tell us that over the last few hundred years we can measure that the average rate of population growth is about half of one percent every year and when we use that empirically derived rate of population growth and start from the evolutionist starting point there wouldn't be any room on earth for any human being we'd be crowding ourselves off the earth but it just so happens that if you start with eight people 4,500 years ago at the end of the flood and you plug in the empirically derived rate of annual pop population growth, you come up with 6.5 billion people in 2000 AD, which is right on the money. So which framework, which hypothesis is validated by not the evolutionary mythology. So the last thing I want to leave you with, because I'm already over time, is that the flood is very important for us to believe in, and it's very important for our children to believe in. And here are four reasons why. First of all, the global flood testifies to God's sovereignty over the world. Our children are being made to believe that God is not involved in the world. Natural disasters happen, but they have nothing to do with God. This is terribly wrong, because God is sovereign, and when our children are taught to believe in the historical reality of the flood, they know that God is sovereign, and sin has its effects on creation. So anybody that's really concerned about the environment should number one be concerned about sin because the greatest threat to the environment is not global warming, it's sin. Number two, the global flood testifies to our dominion over creation. We have people in very high positions in the church who are now exalting the environment above human beings. The global flood is a testimony to the fact that we are the ones that God placed as the king and kings and queens, the princes and princesses of creation. And the entire world had to suffer the effects of our sin because that's the way God set things up. He put us in charge and when we sin, every other creature suffers along with us because we are the ones that God really cares about the most. Thirdly, the ark is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nowadays, our children are often being given the impression that it doesn't really matter what religion you belong to, you'll all end up going to heaven. This is a terrible, terrible deception.
The ark is understood by all the whole tradition of the church to be a type of the church. And if you weren't on the ark, you didn't make it. And if you're not in the church, you're not going to make it where it really matters. And finally, the history of the flood is a warning to our generation. God says in the prophet Amos, he does nothing without telling his servants the prophets. And it so happens that we have prophets like Blessed Elena Aiello, who was beatified by Pope Benedict XVI. She was told by our Lord and the Blessed Mother very recently, because she died around 1960, that the modern world is worse than the people who lived before the flood. Now, how bad is that? Moses tells us that on the eve of the flood, God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that all the thought of their heart was bent upon evil at all times. That's pretty bad. So if we are worse than the people were before Noah's flood, that pretty much guarantees that there is some bad way of thinking that has entered into the very air that we breathe so that even good people are being led away from God, away from the truth, away from what is right. And I submit that evolution fits the bill and that all of us, even those of us who are fighting against it, are still affected by it in ways that we'll come to understand better this afternoon. So I'm sorry for going over time and this is the end of the flood. <laughs> so let us say glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.